Uh, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending on where you are. Uh, my name is Anthony Delmonico with the law firm Finnegan. Uh, this is going to be our third presentation to the IGDA. Uh, the first two, the first presentation focused on an overview of intellectual property law. The presentation focused on uh, specific issues with respect to patent law. Uh, today, I'm very pleased to have as as guests uh, two of my colleagues, two of my partners, Margaret Escane and Naresh Kalaru. They will be addressing uh, a little bit more of a deeper dive into trademarks and copyrights. Uh, so, without further ado, I'm going to let uh, Margaret introduce herself. Hi, my name is Kalaru. I'm a partner at Finnegan, and I specialize in copyright advertising and trademark law. I do quite a bit of work in gaming, both on the software end of copyright issues, as well as advertising issues and other content related issues in gaming. And I'd like to point out that I am always supervised by my love child here, uh, that boy, at all times. So you're in good hands. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Naresh Kilaru. I'm a partner in the trademark and copyright group at Finnegan. I've uh, been here since 2002. I've also been in house counsel at Trinidad Broadcasting, where I uh, oversaw the licensing of a lot of Turner's content to game developers um, and have done quite a bit uh, of work in the gaming field. So I'll just kind of jump uh, right into it. Uh, it, it's been an interesting year uh, on a number of levels, uh, but also in the trademark and, and copyright world where uh, it's been very active. We, there have been a number of uh, Supreme Court cases. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, a couple of them uh, in the trademark field. Uh, in, there were actually two of them this past year. Historically, you would probably only see you know one or two trademark cases every five or six years, but we had two last year. Um, and so what I thought I'd do today is kind of just uh, talk about some of the more interesting cases that have come up over the past year that, that might be uh, relevant to this group and, and kind of pick out the issues that, that I think are relevant. Um, and if I, if it feels like I'm jumping around a little bit. Um, it's just because the, the cases themselves deal with a, a wide range of topics. Uh, and if people have any questions, I, I understand there's a chat feature. Uh, so, you know, feel free to type in any questions uh, as, I, as I go along. So let's go to the uh, first slide. Um, we'll, we'll start with the definition of a, of a trademark. Um, this is from the Lanham Act, uh, which is the name of the U.S. trademark statute. And, and the basic uh, point I wanted to convey here is that the definition is very broad. Um, a, a trademark can basically, under the statute, a trademark can basically be anything under the sun. So, uh, you know, word, name, symbol, or device, or any combination. Um, so it's, it's this statutory definition that allows you to have um, sound marks. For instance, the, the NBC chime is a registered trademark, you know, as is the, the, the Tetris tune um, that you might be familiar with, as, as is the, the roar of the MGM lion. Uh, you also have uh, trademarks uh, that are scents uh, or flavors um, or even motions. Uh, for instance, the uh, Lamborghini uh, owns a registration for the motion of a car door uh, that opens vertically, which, which I think used to be unique at some point. I'm not, I'm not sure it is anymore. Uh, but you, you, the point is you have all sorts of, uh, of trademarks. And, and let's go to the, the next slide. And, and the first case I'll talk about is a, a motion trademark, uh, which came up uh, at the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board. For those of you who don't know, who, who don't know the, the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board is basically the, the appellate body at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office for trademark issues. So if you apply to register a trademark at the PTO, refused, you can appeal it to the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board. So this case comes out of uh, that body, and it's it basically concerns a, a company called The Ride. Um, it's not in operation right now, um, since I don't think anyone is going on buses, but it, it was about a, a bus tour in New York City um, that where, where The Ride uh, involved, uh, people would 
tourists would sit on the bus and you'd go around uh, New York City and people, random people like, you know, a stockbroker or, you know, a delivery man uh, would, would kind of jump out and do um, dance and song, you know, as the car was, uh, as, as the bus was going by. And it was, it was kind of unique. I had never heard of a tour um, like that. So I, I think, you know, their, their claim that this was unique, I think was accurate. Uh, and so they, they tried to get a registration uh, basically on this uh, concept of people breaking out into song and dance as, as a bus was going uh, by on a tour. Uh, the, the PTO examining attorney initially refused registration uh, on, on a number of grounds, including the fact that people uh, probably wouldn't perceive this as a trademark. Um, and then the applicant appealed to the Trademark Child Appeal Board. And so the, the applicant actually, you know, went to the trouble of sub submitting survey evidence. Uh, it really wanted to get this tra trademark. Um, and, but the TTAB ultimately said, you know, we, we can't give any weight to the survey uh, results because it, it surveyed the improper uh, customers. Apparently they, they only surveyed past customers instead of current customers. Um, so the, the TTAB concluded that the survey results were biased. Uh, but the larger point is, so, so the, ultimately the, the TTAB affirmed the examining attorney's refusal. But, but the takeaway here is that the PTO actually doesn't say this can't function as a trademark. Um, it, it's really just a, a failure of evidence. Uh, and, and it just underscores that, you know, on a different record, you know, something like this potentially may have, may have gotten through. So it just uh, emphasizes, that, you know, really... Trademarks can encompass virtually anything. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So in terms of the, the types of trademarks, the, the more typical trademarks uh, you see are, of course, words um, and logos, uh, as well as slogans and, and taglines. And there, there are a few examples here. You know, one question we get a lot uh, is, if, you know, with respect to logos, especially is, you know, should I, should I register the logo uh, or should I register something in standard characters? Standard characters are, you know, the, just the words and, and plain letters like you see Pac-Man and, and PlayStation. Um, or should I register the, the logo version of those? Uh, and, and the answer, I mean, it, it, it depends, but uh, typically a, a, a registration in standard characters gives you the, the broadest scope of protection. Um, so you will, you're, you're, in almost all cases, you're, you're better off filing for something in standard characters. If you have a logo, certainly you can, you can register that as well. Um, but unless you're going to be policing the logo independently of the words, um, really it's the, 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 the main value is, is getting a, a registration in standard characters. Um, and, you know, for instance, in a counterfeiting situation, if you have a registration for your mark in standard characters uh, and somebody is using, you know, some logo version of the mark, your standard character registration is going to cover you in that situation. On the other hand, if you own, a, if you apply to register only your specific logo and there's a counterfeit product out there uh, that is using a slightly different logo, um, at least under the counterfeiting statute, since you have to, you, you have to show that they are using the identical mark, your logo registration is not going to be able to be the basis for a counterfeiting claim if the other side is using um, a, a slightly different logo. So in, in that situation, again, you, you would be better off uh, something in, in standard characters. Let's go to the next slide. Now, you know, all trademarks are uh, not, not created equal. They, they have different strengths and weaknesses and, and they kind of fall along this spectrum. Um, and the most, you know, at the top of the spectrum, which is considered to be the most distinctive, um, they're fanciful or coin trademarks. Basically, you know, that, that means that those are words uh, that are invented. They're not in the dictionary. So bayonetta, uh, it's not a dictionary term. It's completely just made up uh, for purposes of serving as a trademark. Those types of trademarks are considered inherently very strong and, and they are on the strongest end 
uh, of the spectrum. So from a legal standpoint, um, you get very broad protection. Uh, one step down from that is arbitrary marks, and, and that's basically what it sounds like. It's a It would be a dictionary term, but when applied to um, the under, whatever the underlying product is, there's no relationship. Um, so Fortnite is obviously a dictionary term, but it has no connection really to a, a video game. Um, call, one, one level down from that, Call of Duty. The, these types of trademarks, suggestive trademarks, are basically uh, marks that kind of suggest what the underlying uh, game or product might be. So there's, so there's some relationship, but it's not clear as to what it is. Those are so suggestive trademarks are also considered uh, inherently distinctive. Um, you, you can register those, um, but not as strong as arbitrary or coined marks. And again, one level down from there uh, are descriptive trademarks. Those are trademarks which directly uh, convey what the underlying product or, or game uh, is about. So Hitman, uh, you know, that, that's clearly a video game about a Hitman. Those descriptive trademarks, typically, you can't get a registration for those unless you show that you've been using it for a, it's typically five years, sometimes it can be less, sometimes it can be more, but you have to show that those marks have acquired distinctiveness through use uh, before you can get a registration. Uh, and of course, uh, generic trademarks are, are never protectable at all. We'll talk about the booking.com uh, Supreme Court decision in, in just a second. Let's go to the next slide. So in terms of, you know, this, this spectrum of distinctiveness, you kind of have these competing uh, interests, you know, from a legal standpoint, um, you, if you just want the, the strongest trademark from a legal standpoint, you're, you're going to go with a coined uh, or arbitrary trademark. Uh, the, the downside of that, of course, from a marketing standpoint, is that those marks don't give you an immediate idea uh, of what the underlying game is about. So you may have to spend more marketing dollars uh, to educate the public on, on what the underlying product is. Whereas if you go with something descriptive or suggestive, um, you, you there is some relationship to the underlying product and those marketers tend to like those. Um, they, they like descriptive and suggestive marks because they like that relationship to the underlying product to, to tell consumers what the uh, what the product is about. The trade-off, of course, is just they are not as strong from leak from a legal standpoint as a, a coined or an arbitrary uh, trademark. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So the, the booking.com decision, this was a case that came out of the Supreme Court uh, last year, um, de dealing with generic marks. As you can see from the, the slide here, they, you know, booking.com, they, they use it generically, <laughs> very, very openly on their website. They, they say the world's number one choice for booking accommodations. Uh, if that's not a generic use, uh, I'm not sure what is. But they, so they say they, they applied to register booking.com as a trademark. I think it was in 2011. Uh, the PTO rejected it uh, on the ground that it's generic. And, and they, uh, the PTO actually has this rule that adding .com to a generic term uh, doesn't make it a trademark. So they cited that rule and they said, hey, look, you can't, um, you're, you're not going to be able to get a registration for this. So this get, ultimately gets appealed all the way to the Supreme Court uh, over many years. And, and the Supreme Court takes a look at the, uh, at the record and the evidence and basically says that there, there is enough evidence uh, in the record that consumers would recognize booking.com as a trademark, uh, including some survey evidence uh, that they gave some weight to some survey evidence that was introduced uh, in a lower court proceeding. And the, and the Supreme Court basically says there is there can be no per se rule that adding .com to a generic term uh, like booking automatically results in a, gen in a generic trademark. You have to consider each case individually. You have to look at the specific evidence in each case and, and how consumers perceive um, uh, the, the term at issue. So again, this is just another uh, indication that really anything can be a trademark if you can prove it. Uh, if you can prove that consumers identify um, it as a as a brand. And so the court, um, the court also, Supreme Court also noted that the PTO had allowed 
registrations for art.com, for an art website, as well as dating.com. Uh, and so it, it basically said there's no legitimate reason, you know, that booking.com also, you know, can't serve a, a trademark function. So ultimately, you know, booking.com gets a registration. Uh, what, what's the practical value of it? Uh, is booking.com going to be able to prevent others from, from using uh, marks like ebooking.com or, you know, something, you know, slightly different? Probably not. I think that the, the Supreme Court itself says uh, that the, the rights here are going to be very narrow. So again, the, the scope of protection your mark is going to be afforded really depends on the type of mark. So even though they have a registration, the practical value of it um, is, is probably low. They're probably not going to do, they're probably not going to be able to do a whole lot of enforcement um, against similar marks because the, the Supreme Court basically recognizes as much that, that the rights are going to be very, uh, very narrow. So the takeaway here is, you know, if you're considering a, a generic mark, for instance, you know, games.com, I think that's taken, uh, and, and you, and you think you can build a brand around it, you know, in theory you can, uh, but it's going to take an enormous marketing budget, you know, not to mention the legal expenses, uh, and, and especially for startups in particular, it, it would generally make sense to choose a, a mark that's more distinctive. Uh, let's go to the next slide. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this case. This is just, uh, this is the other Supreme Court case that came out last year. It's basically about damages. Um, in, in trademark cases, typically you go for an injunction. Uh, but, you know, what if someone is infringing your mark or making counterfeits and, and you want to recover damages, uh, what, what are the options? You, you typically have two choices. It's actual damages and uh, recovering the infringer's profits. Actual damages are typically difficult to prove. Uh, so practically speaking, you would always try to go after the defendant's profits. Um, you know, on that issue, in terms of getting a, a defendant's profits, there was historically a circuit split. Uh, some circuits said, that you had to show willfulness. Some circuits said that you didn't. Uh, and the Supreme Court basically resolved that split saying that you, you do not have to show willfulness. So the, the practical impact of this is that uh, if you're litigating in, in one of those jurisdictions where willfulness was previously a prerequisite, uh, it's now uh, slightly easier to recover defendants' profits. Um, so that's the, the takeaway from that case. Let's go to the next slide. Naresh, can you just explain real quick what willfulness is? Sure, yeah, absolutely. Thanks for pointing that out. So willfulness is, uh, in trademark law, if, a, if an infringer um, willfully takes your trademark, that it basically means that they have knowledge of your trademark. They knew your, of your trademark. They purposefully took it. They wanted to capitalize on the goodwill that you have built up in that trademark. If you can prove that, that then you can show willful infringement. And, and that's what some circuits previously used to require uh, in order for a in order to recover the, the defendant's profits, but that's that's no longer the case under the Supreme Court's decision. So bona fide uh, intent to use, uh, very important for startups. Uh, in particular, a lot of startups want to file intent to use applications because uh, they may think of a trademark right now, but it may take a year, two, sometimes three years in order to actually launch the business. Uh, and so you want to reserve your rights before anybody else grabs the name. So you can file an intent to use application and, and when you do that, you basically sign a declaration saying that you have a bona fide intent to, to use the mark. And, you know, most people, they, they check the box, they sign the declaration, but that, that declaration actually does mean something, uh, as, as uh, you'll see in this case. So in this case, uh, Beyonce applied to register Blue Ivy Carter for a line of baby clothes. Uh, someone had a prior registration for Blue Ivy for event planning services and opposed Beyonce's application on the ground that Beyonce lacked a bona fide intent to use. The argument was that, you know, Beyonce just was reserving the mark, had really no intent to use it. She just didn't want other people to use it. Uh, and one of the things uh, that the opposer points to is Jay-Z's statements in this Vanity Fair art article where he basically says, um, yeah, that I, I am basically trying to reserve the mark. We're not really intending to use it. 
Uh, we just didn't want anybody else to use it, uh, which is, which is, you definitely don't want to make statements like that um, because it, it undercuts uh, the, the declaration that you just signed saying that you had a bona fide intent to use something. In this particular case, the board said, well, you know, the statements are made by Jay-Z. They can't be attributed to Beyonce. So the, the board discounts it um, and ultimately rules against the opposer. But it's just a reminder that when you sign that declaration saying that you have a bona fide intent to use a mark, it does mean something. Uh, and sometimes you do have to prove it. I mean, we've seen a number of cases where companies don't have documents uh, backing it up. Uh, and oppositions are granted on that basis. So as you are going through your startup phase uh, or really for any business and, and you sign that declaration, make sure you keep all of the documents uh, that would show that you had a bona fide intent to use this trademark so you can back it up if it's ever challenged. Let's go to the next slide. Um, abandonment, uh, you know, this this comes into play, I think, in, in the gaming industry. Uh, for instance, if what if you want to use a trademark of an older game, for instance, that was popular in in the seventies and eighties, and, and that's no longer being sold? Uh, can you can you do that? Can you appropriate a trademark that uh, was previously used, that was previously popular, uh, and, and commercialize it? Uh, now, can you can you do that? Well, it depends. Um, this is exactly what this company, uh, Retro Brands, tried to do in this case. Uh, Retro Brands tried to prove that the mark Chicklets was abandoned, uh, so it could launch its own brand of Chicklets. Um, so the standard to prove abandonment uh, in the U.S. is three years of non-use plus the plus an intent not to resume use. Uh, ultimately, uh, the the board fines against retro brands because they were only able to prove, I think it was two and a half years of use, uh, and there was insufficient evidence of intent. Generally, the, the takeaway here is that it is, abandonment is fairly difficult to prove. Uh, so you want to be very careful before you use the name of a historical game, even if you think uh, that it hasn't been used for some years. Um, you you got to do the due diligence and um, ideally get get an opinion uh, from from an attorney uh, on on whether that mark is in fact available for use. Let's go to the next slide. Fair use. This is also another issue uh, that comes up a lot uh, in, in the gaming industry, especially you know with game compatibility. Like you know what, what for instance, what if you're putting out a game that's that's compatible with various systems. Uh, can you use the name of those systems in marketing, saying that your game is compatible on um, you know X, Y, and Z system? Again, it, it depends. This was a case um, between Bluetooth and Chrysler. Chrysler was using the Chrysler was using the Bluetooth uh, trademarks on vehicles, and uh, I think they were using Bluetooth enabled uh, radio units. And, and Bluetooth became aware that um, Chrysler was using its trademarks without uh, taking a license, and, and so they filed a lawsuit. Uh, and Chrysler basically, in its defense, says that the Bluetooth marks are generic, and you know even if the Bluetooth marks are valid, that, that it's fair use. So this is going to be an interesting case uh, to watch. Obviously, it would be a huge uh, loss uh, for Bluetooth if its marks are, are deemed generic, or if the court says. Uh, that, that people can use the Bluetooth trademark without paying licensing fees. Um, so, you know, this is, this is it's an ongoing case, and um, you know, we'll, we'll have to see how, how it comes out. Let's go to the next slide. Um, another um, thing you see in the gaming industry, you, you do see a lot of uh, interplay between trademark law and, and the First Amendment. And just continuing with the, the topic of, using another company's trademarks. Can you use another company's trademarks within the game itself? So the plaintiff in this case um, owned the Humvee trademark uh, and sued Activision for featuring Humvee vehicles in the game Call of Duty. Uh, the court basically relies on the First Amendment and uh, dismisses the, the plaintiff's trademark infringement claims, saying that you know featuring the actual vehicles 
uh, used by military operations was necessary to uh, evoke a sense of realism. Um, and so the court basically takes a, a fairly broad view of the First Amendment uh, and says that Activision can do this. Um, but courts have really, there is a, the, the cases are really divided on this issue. Um, some courts have taken a narrower view of the First Amendment, uh, and, and this particular area of the law especially is very fact dependent, uh, and, and courts have really gone uh, both ways on this. So I will leave it there, and uh, I will turn it over to Margaret. Great. Thank you. Anthony, if you want to drop off, I can present my own screen. All right, hopefully you can see my screen and I'll be talking about copyright in gaming. So thank you, Naresh, for that very interesting discussion of trademark law. Um, I'm going to start with a little bit of background on copyright so that we're all using the same words. Now that you know what a patent is and now that you know what a trademark is, let's talk a little bit about what copyright covers. So what is copyright? A copyright protects an original work of authorship, which sounds complicated and boring, but really it just means that it protects something, a, a something that is creative. Uh, and under US law, creative means original, and original means that it wasn't copied from an existing source and it exhibits a minimal level of creativity. Uh, the other issue is that it must be fixed in a tangible medium of expression which is also a very complicated and legalese way of saying that it must be easily reproducible. So if something is ephemeral and can't be reproduced, then it is not subject to copyright protection. But if something is fixed, so it's recorded in some way, a CD, a DVD, something, um, then it is capable of being reproduced and is subject to copyright protection. So it sounds complicated, but it's really not. It needs to be original and it needs to be reproducible. Uh, what kinds of works are covered by copyright? Uh, all sorts of things are covered by copyright. I think most importantly here, where literary works um, are covered, and that is anything that's public, that's text-based, articles, narratives, treatments, that sort of thing, standards, if you use that in your work. Um, software programs, I call out here um, uh, separately, but they're actually a form of literary work. Also, audiovisual works are protected by copyright in the United States, and that includes video games. Sound recordings are protected, uh, and sound recordings are the actual re uh, reduction of the performance to a reproducible uh, medium. So, once you uh, once you if you sing a song, then you, and you record it and you create a CD, that CD is the sound recording or whatever other way that you've reduced it, your, your MP4 files. Um, music is covered, but music and sound recordings are not exactly the same thing. Music is the composition and the lyrics, but not necessarily a sound recording. So you can have a protection for music without having protection for sound recording because the music, you might have never um, performed the, the music, the composition and the lyrics and recorded it. The next thing that's protectable under US law is pictorial, graphic, and sculptural works. Those are, I think is pretty straightforward. Those are works of the visual arts, but they include things um, like drawings of characters, art, photography, technical drawings, um, and certain logos are also protectable under copyright law. I know Naresh mentioned logos is protectable under trademark and some, and, and they are, and that's the primary way of protecting a, a logo. But in under some circumstances, um, logos can also be protected by copyright, and then they're protected in both ways. You don't have to give up one to get the other. Um, there's also protection for a combination of these various kinds of materials. So you can have a literary work, that's maybe also a sound recording, a pictorial work that's incorporated into an audiovisual work, etc. Uh, what is not protected by copyright? Now this is a long list, and, and maybe it's better because it's all fun colors, but I think the most important things for for this audience and for gaming audiences is that ideas are not protectable. And we're going to go we're going to look at a case where that became an issue in a few minutes. But I wanted to call that out that copyright protects something reproducible. 
something actually written down or 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 created in a way that can be distributed to other people. Um, and so ideas are inherently are not copyrightable because they could be expressed in a variety of different ways. So what else is not copyrightable? In the United States, typeface is not copyrightable, but I do note that it is, that's not the case in other countries. Um, short phrases and titles are not protected by copyright, they're protected by trademark if, if you otherwise um, uh, meet the requirements of a trademark of trademark protection. Uh, and then, you know, other things here are not protected. I don't know that they're so relevant to the uh, to this audience. I'm happy to take any questions you might have about it. But I did want to flag some specific things that the that are not protected under US law by copyright. Uh, what else is not protected? The public domain. And I always want to bring up this slide in, in any presentation where I just want to teach a little bit about copyright because the, the word public domain or the phrase public domain, it has a very specific meaning in copyright law. It is not everything that is available to the public. The public domain is not that. The public domain is materials that are no longer or have never been protected by copyright. So you can use it colloquially and say public domain meaning something available to the public but if you're talking in a legal context you're talking to your lawyers or you're trying to see whether you can get protection or you're trying to see whether you've done something wrong and might have infringed public domain has a really really specific meaning um and it's these four elements here it's things that have expired it's things that have uh, works that maybe have not were not registered properly um before 1962 which i know is a very specific uh year but that's the way the law works um works prepared by the federal government are usually in the public domain um and then things that are published before 1989 without a copyright notice the law changed in 1989, 1989 with respect to copyright notices so that is sort of the, those are the four corners of the public domain in the United States. It's not everything that is available to the public. Margaret, we got, we received one question. Sure. In the chat. It, it said basically, are actual sounds, noises, and special effect sounds, which can be reproduced in most any game, copyrighted, or just the music and any significant unique quotes? So it, that's, a, that's a really interesting question. There was a, there was a case about that. Um, uh, an artist sued Madonna um, over the K over there for use of a 0.23 seconds of a horn sound in the song Vogue, and the court held that that was an insufficient um, work for even though it was reproducible and and saved in a medium of expression, it was too short to be considered independently copyrightable. So it, the answer is that it's a little squishy. Um, if you have the, um, if you can show that it is original and sufficiently creative, then you might be able to get protection for some sort of quote unquote sounds. But overall, if you're just trying to mimic the sound of something else, like sounds of nature or sounds of, um, you know, like an engine, something like that, um, those would probably be not copyright protection. And then, um, but music certainly would be within the context of a game and the game as a whole, to the extent that there is a narrative that, that has a sound um, effect, not just not just music, but um, if there's maybe an uh, NPC that talks, um, maybe the script of those, um, uh, the scripts that are available uh, within the game that are not controlled necessarily by the player could potentially be subject to copyright protection. Uh, hopefully that answers the question. If not, please feel free to, to ping uh, Anthony and he will let me know. Jay, yeah, I just I just wanted to add just recently, uh, Nintendo applied to to uh, to copyright the term. Uh, oh, actually, I'm sorry. They actually tried to trademark the Mario coin sound effect. So that's the noise that you make when you try to uh, get the coin in Super Mario Brothers. Right, so so that goes back to what Naresh was talking about, that trademarks can actually be all kinds of different things, um, as long as they are a source identifier, that people people associate them with that source. But that's, pro but I don't think that would be subject to, to copyright protection. But I don't know, I don't wanna speak to it, I haven't looked at the issue, but it might be not, not long enough. And, in, and the, the office might say that it's too short and not sufficiently created for the purposes of copyright protection as opposed to trademark. And we just received one more question. Are game mechanics protected by copyright? 
Oh, that is a that is a very interesting question. Um, game mechanics per se are not are unlikely to be protected. The way the game mechanics are coded are likely to be protected. So could you protect a game some some aspect of game mechanics by itself? Um, I don't want to say absolutely not because I want to see it. It's a copyright is a definitely and I, I know it when I see it standard, um, unfortunately. But uh, but I would say, you know, just off the top of my head and, and without seeing anything, I think it would be challenging to to um, protect and exclude others from using a particular game mechanic which or, or something something about the game whereas whereas you might be but whereas you would absolutely be able to prevent them from using your specific coding um, that creates that that ability or that functionality hopefully again I don't unfortunately I can't see the question so Anthony is my uh, my leader here so if there's anything else just he'll he'll chime in um, unfortunately, my slides. Uh, hopefully, we'll get we'll power through these slides. If we don't get to open source, that that's sad, but we'll be okay. Um, I wanted to talk. So these are the things that are also not in the public domain. Um, most works published after 1926, things available on the internet, unless they other meet the other requirements, are not a public domain. They might be available to the public, but not in the public domain. Um, so those are just some. There's some other categories of non-public domain issues. But I wanted to give a, an example, which is maybe some of you are familiar with this litigation. This was a case that was decided at the end of 2020. Um, I'm a huge Star Trek fan, and so I was, I'm was. i always excited, and Star Trek litigates a lot, so I'm always excited to see a case. But this one was interesting. I thought this was, a, so there was a person named Abdeen, and they created, uh, on, the le on your left, they uh, created the science fiction uh, video game called Tardigrades, and it was like about space traveling tardigrades that absorbed people. It was a, the game mechanics were a little fuzzy in my opinion, in the, in, in the court's opinion, but maybe one of you knows about this game. Uh, but in any event, uh, I don't know if any of you have seen Star Trek Discovery, but in the initial, so I hope I'm not, this is a spoiler alert, uh, but there is a plot line where the, um, where the uh, crew is um, navigates the universe. If that's about, maybe that's a good way of putting it through the use of tardigrade power. But it's like this giant tardigrade, um, and it's a long story. But anyway, the court held there. The, the, interestingly, and the reason I put it here is because one of the holdings of the court in this case was that the concept of tardigrades in space was an idea, and that these two. Um, entities, Abdin or pre people, and the and our friends at CBS um, uh, executed that idea in very different ways, and therefore there was no infringement. And therefore, the the CBS Star Trek did not infringe the game because even though they had similar things conceptually about tardigrades, about space travel, about like sort of the the human tardigrade interaction, um, conceptually the tardigrades. In fact, there are tardigrades in space, right? Um, so the, the court held that it wasn't sufficient to have, to show these same ideas. You actually have to show that the expression was the same. Did you, did you show, are they, are there, are there, um, visual or narrative similarities that might be protected? And the court said no. All right. Um, next we're going to turn to copyright ownership. And I know I'm speaking very quickly. Again, if you have any questions, let me know. I have a lot of slides to get through. So um, I just want to make sure we cover it. But with that being said, this next section on copyright ownership, I think is probably the most important for today's audience. If you take away nothing else from my discussion today, I really want you to understand how copyright ownership works. Um, because I think that at, for the smaller companies, um, this is a critical, critical issue smaller companies get it wrong. And then instead of focusing on their business, they're focusing on trying to make sure that they re recapturing ownership of the materials that, that were created for their games and for their advertising campaigns. So let's talk about this. Again, I'd like to throw up a red flag here. I want, this is the most important part of this presentation in my experience for smaller gaming entities. All right. In the United States, and I would like to point this out, that this is only in the United States. Germany, Canada, completely different laws, very different. So do not apply this. If you're if you're hiring people in Germany to program, 
none of this is applicable. We, we, we would need to talk to you about what the differences are. But assuming you, you're, you're working in the United States, um, the ownership of, the, uh, of a work is governed by the Copyright Act, the statute. And in that statute, in that law, the author or creator is the presumed owner of a work they create. So if I am working on a, on a piece of code, I, as the author, am the presumed owner of that code. That is the baseline. But the, car, the, the act also says that there is this concept called a work made for hire. And the work made for hire concept is actually divided into two separate co concepts. I wish they had given them different names, but they haven't. So the first type of work made for hire is a work prepared by an employee within the scope of their employment. That is, so if, you, if I am working for Best Games and I'm, an, I'm a proper employee, I get all the benefits and, and proper forms, um, and I was hired as a programmer, then automatically by operation of law, anything I program is owned by Best Games, is owned by that company that I am employed by. However, if the other kind of work made for hire is called a work made for hire by commission, in that case, I am not an employee of best games. I am a freelancer, a contractor, a vendor of some sort. In that instance, um, a work made for hire by commission, the parties, in other words, best games and me, the freelancer, have to agree in writing that the work is going to be a work made for hire. Um, and then, and only then is the, uh, is the employer or the, 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 the person who hired best, I like best game. So only in that case is the best game then created, then considered the author of the work. So it's really critical that you understand this distinction, right? If you're an employee, the, the company automatically becomes the author and owner. In a work made for hire by commission, you need an agreement in writing that specifically says that the employer that best games is going to be the owner and author of that work. Otherwise, you might have a big problem. You might be hiring somebody to code and you do not own that. You do not own that project because again, the author or creator is the presumed owner unless you follow these important rules that are under copyright. So let's look at this, how this might play out in real life. Um, a programmer is employed by a widget and to take, uh, widget, to take um, photos at a widget event. Uh, who owns the copyright? Well, he's a programmer, or, and he works for, uh, and he works for Widget, but he works as a programmer, not as a photographer. So it's possible, at least, that the copyright in the photos belong to the employee, because the photography is not within their scope of their employment. But then, if you flip it, if that same programmer codes a library of font software, which, by the way, font software is awful. If you ever want to talk font software, pick up the phone, give me a call. It's a very strange world. Um, but, but let's say they program a library of font software to use in widgets, games, and advertising. Those rights will automat should automatically vest in widget as the employer for hire. Um, so those are two examples of how that might play out in that employee situation where you have an actual employee. Let's talk about if you hire a contractor or a vendor. This is kind of where things get dangerous because smaller companies often don't have the ability to to take on all of the employees that they need to program. They do work with freelancers. Um, and so it's important you understand what's going on here. The first thing is that there are limited types of works that can be made for hire by commission. The statute says, you know, not everything can be made for hire by commission. And we'll talk about what, what that is in a second. Um, so the question becomes, um, does code fall within that definition. It does not expressly fall into that definition, but there are some arguments that the that uh, code should be available for a work made for hire by commission, but it is not expressly in the code. Uh, I'm sorry, in the act. And so we do, when, when we're drafting these kinds of agreements for our gaming clients and for really any small software developer, we are we try to be very careful that we draft these agreements correctly so that the code becomes um so that the that the client the, the game company is both the uh owner and author of that code but there is some risk involved in that issue uh, again if, if anthony if there are any questions about this let me know but but um this is this is critical for for anyone in this space in that's working in the united states 
Um, and so I mentioned that the works, what kind of works under the Copyright Act can be made for hire by commission, by employee, anything, by commission, that's that written agreement requirement. Um, these, this is the list and I, I, I'm not going to read to you, but when it comes to code, we generally argue, the general argument is that it's part of a collective work, it's part of an audiovisual work, it's part, or it's part of um, a, uh, a supplementary work or a compilation. Uh, I'm sorry, not a supplementary work, or it's part of a compilation. So those are the three main categories, the collective work, the motion picture, or audiovisual work, or the compilation uh, that we um, that we try to fit it in to, to those categories. And, and, um, so there, there's, there's case law that backs up those positions, but it's not, uh, it's not a hundred percent certain because, because again, code is not expressly stated in this text and code is, is considered text for the purposes of copyright and text is also not in this, in this, um, definition. So one more caution. If you are in, uh, if you're in California, be very careful about how you draft these agreements. You really should at this point get legal counsel to draft them for you because I don't want to make you have problems. But California has this very interesting and unusual labor code section that says that if you hire a freelancer and the free and it is a work made for hire agreement, that person automatically becomes your employee, um, which is sort of undermines the whole point of a work made for hire by commission agreement. I've never seen this issue challenged, but it's here and, and California has been providing and creating more and more gig work type of protections for people. Um, so, so it could be, it could be getting even more complicated because of all the gig law, gig working law kind of things that are going on. Uh, but I did want you to be aware of this, this labor code section in California. If you're in it, if you're, if you're in California or you're hiring freelancers in California, um, maybe you want to talk to a lawyer about how this impacts, whether you're creating or whether you're hiring employees by accident. Um, uh, Margaret, yes. real, real quick, with respect to what you were talking about, you gave the, the kind of source code person as an example. What about hiring folks for art or music or audiovisual work uh, for a game, would, would that, that still apply? Uh, those, so the work for hire things, yes, it all, it applied, the code is the part that's a little, that, that's a little wonky because, because it's so, um, it, it's not squarely within the, um, the, the statute. So, but uh, it really depends the other kinds of works that are that are available. Music is pretty easy because we think that that's clearly in the, within the audiovisual work exception or within the audiovisual um, list. So art as well. Uh, those are those are a lot easier to um, to art to show that they are appropriately work made works made for hire by commission. Um, so just a little bit more, just a few more slides on this work made for hire issue. Uh, if you create a work made for hire by commission or an agreement, you want to, the agreement should include a description of the work, uh, express language that it's going to be a commissioned, a work made for hire by commission and an assignment of rights. Because just in case the work, just in case the court says, hmm, this doesn't look like a work made for hire to me, then at least you have this backup of an assignment. Um, that gives you the rights in the work, if not authorship rights. So you become the owner, if not the author. And there's a whole different set of issues um, with that that I don't that I don't really have time to cover. Um, but but the it, it's a backstop to a work made for hire agreement. It's also a way in California if you don't want to deal with the whole labor code issue, maybe you just take the assignment. Um, and forget a work made for hire. Just, just again, talk to an attorney because you do want to understand what you might be giving up under that um, that approach. One other thing to think about is timing uh, of work made of works made for hire. Is you want to get that you want to pay you want it papered before the project is complete. If you wait to sign that uh, to sign the documents afterwards, there are some courts that do not allow a, um, a work made for hire agreements to be signed after the, the project is finished. So uh, we prefer before the project starts because we're lawyers, um, 
you have to do it at least during the, but but it has to be done at least during the, the pendency of the project. If you wait too long, you might have a, a bigger problem on your hands than you, than you might think. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the difference between an assignment and a license. I'm sorry if, if this is like super easy and, and, and people are like, no, I totally understand that, but sometimes people don't. And so I always want to cover it. An assignment makes the assignee the new owner, but does not make them the author. So if I write a book and I assign it to you, I am still the author, but you are the owner. The, I'm giving up ownership rights as the author, but I'm not giving up my authorship rights. And in the United States, an assignment must be in writing. A license is when you get the right to use something, but you don't own it. So again, let's, I'm gonna change myself now. Now I'm a songwriter and I'm going to let you use my song in your, in your game. I'm gonna give you rights to the song, but I'm not giving up my like, ownership rights or my authorship rights. Everything vests with me, you just have some sort of license to use it that has some specific parameters. So it's going to be in one game or for one year or, you know, the parameters can be almost anything the parties can think of, but, but it's going to be limited in some way. And me as the author, I don't give up, I don't give up ownership rights or authorship rights. Talk a little bit about copyright note. Uh, Margaret, real, real quick, what's the difference between authorship rights and ownership rights? Just, just to make sure we're clear, like what, what do you, what, what are you getting as an author versus owner? Right. So again, the author is the person that created the work. They have every, they have all of the rights, everything, the right to do all exploitation of that work, unless there's some sort of agreement otherwise. Um, so that's what the, the, the author has the best, most strong rights. Uh, from anybody, unless there's a contract, a written, preferably a written contract to the contrary. Um, an owner might have some rights, um, but they have acquired through an assignment anyway, they have acquired those rights through an assignment. And so there are aspects of the law that's, that still protect the author. And, and I think that's a little bit beyond, I only have a few minutes left and I don't think I'm obviously, I'm not gonna get through all my slides, um, but, but there are nuances that come after that. But basically, like if you think of it as a spectrum, authorship rights um, it, are the best and license rights are kind of the weakest, even though they all might be fairly strong legally. Um, let's talk a little bit about copyright notices. We really like to see notices. Uh, they're not required in the United States anymore, but we, we do like to see the notices uh, because they do protect you. Um, I would put, notices in everything on all your advertising on your websites the more copyright notices the better as far as i'm concerned in the code it should be in all the headers that's my preference sometimes people just put it at the very beginning which i don't really understand because what's the beginning of code anymore but um but so once is better than nothing but in every header um or every you know five thousand lines or whatever you want to have your to, to be your rubric um, that's, that's what we like to see to, to pursue, um, because it lets us, if, if it's ever uh, copied, it lets us uh, pursue some interesting claims. Um, so not rec not required, but highly recommended. Um, so these are my banana peel because these are the ways people slip up. I know lame, I know. Um, but it's the best I could come up with. Um, so if you see a notice on third party materials, um, proceed very carefully. You might be walking into an infringement issue. Don't remove or alter the notice. Um, that is, if you're removing a copyright notice, you're doing something wrong, like that should be a huge red flag coming at you saying, okay, this is probably not a good idea. Um, be careful with open source materials. Their use is often conditioned on leaving notices in place. And I litigated a case for quite a while where where it was an open source product, but the attribution, the notices were removed. And the only, that was really the only part of the license that, that, that anybody wanted was the attribution. And it was a, it was crazy, long-term, very expensive litigation that we ended up prevailing on. Um, even though the, we represented the, the party that, that, uh, um, well, it doesn't matter. The, the point is don't remove notices if you see them in open source code, uh, because that's what your licenses often require. Um, if you're looking at, you know, I, the last thing is may not be so, so relevant to gaming materials, but notices aren't always on the front. They can always, they can be in all kinds of places. You have to look for them a little bit. 
what constitutes copyright infringement? Reproducing, creating an op unauthorized derivative works. That's like changing a, a putting taking a character from one from one game and putting it into your own. That would be creating an unauthorized. That would be both reproducing and creating an unauthorized derivative work. Distributing an infringing product, performing publicly. There's lots of different ways to infringe a copyright. Um, it can be using the entire work, it can be using part of it, um, or it can be exceeding the scope of a license. You know, like we talked about that music thing, right? Um, you know, you said you're only going to use it in one game, and the license says you can use it in one game, but now you've also put clips of it up on your social media to promote the game, but the license doesn't let you do that. And now you've exceeded the scope of the license and are potentially an infringer. I'm not saying you don't have defenses, but it can get pretty weird. Um, quickly. So you want to be careful about, about making sure that when you license uh, uh, something to use, you're doing it in a way that covers all of the kinds of things that you want to do with the work. Um, I'm going to skip this slide, I think, um, just because I'm running out of time. Um, avoid, uh, you know, how to avoid infringement claims. Minimize the use of third party materials where you are incorporating unlicensed third-party content, don't do it. But if you do, don't use it in advertising or social media, keep it to the game itself. Um, consider how difficult it would be to remove if you get an objection or a court order. You know, if, you're, if you have a piece of unlicensed material that is just completely integrated into your game, um, that could be the death knell of your game if you lose and you can't get it out. So if it's easy to take out, then maybe you maybe it's okay. But if it's not so easy to take out, then you're really setting yourself up potentially for a big problem. Other rights might be implicated, like we just talked about, trademark, name, image, likeness rights. I'm sure all of you have heard about name, image, like tattoo cases and all that. Um, so, so those are other, you, even if there's not a copyright infringement, there might be something else. Uh, music is particularly high risk, as somebody else already mentioned. So you want to get your licenses in place from that. Um, and while there are some good fair use decisions, like uh, in this in the gaming space, like Naresh talked about the um, the the Humvee decision, it, it can be a difficult legal strategy. So sometimes it's easier to license uh, than than it is to uh, try to figure out your way around the legal issues. I'm gonna skip the defenses. Um, Margaret, uh, I think we may be coming to an end here. So yeah. So I just want to see if there's. Anything. Okay, so this is, I just wanted, to, this is an example of an infringement that's going to trial. Um, and this was a poster that was, the, the Rosa poster was copied into a game, into a game to, uh, um, and we're going to see which way this goes, whether this is considered infringement, but it, I would be surprised if this doesn't settle before it goes to trial. Um, I think, I think I'm running out of time, unfortunately, but, but we do recommend registration for games. It can be a little bit challenging, I think, sometimes, but uh, I'm happy to talk about that offline or if somebody wants to reach out to me afterwards. Copyright registration is the best way to protect uh, copyrighted works. And so this is what, you know, this is, there's some slides in here, and I think you'll have an opportunity to, to have these slides, I'm not sure. Um, but you might want to take a look at, at how, um, you know, what are some of the, the ways that we can, um, that you can talk about that you can deal with registration, particularly in mobile games, uh, where there's where you really want to talk, think about the cost benefit of the registration process here in the United States. Um, I think that is my time, unfortunately. So uh, again, I'm not sure if these slides are if the whole deck is going to be available, but I'm happy to go over it if we've got another five minutes, or um, or anybody has any questions, please don't hesitate. Uh, my information is easily found on these slides and I'm happy to to answer questions afterwards. Thank you very much, Margaret, and thank you, Naresh, for uh, for presenting today. Uh, again, my name is Anthony Delmonico from Finnegan and Margaret and Naresh both work at Finnegan. So if you just type in our names in Google and type Finnegan, you will find our contact information very easily. Uh, I'll talk with IGDA regarding uh, getting the uh, slides uh, available to uh, whoever uh, participated. But again, I thank everybody for joining today or for joining in the future, for those of you seeing the uh, the video of this. And uh forward to our next presentation to the group. Uh, to the extent that anybody in the crowd does have some questions regarding IP that they would like to see a presentation on, please reach out to the IGDA and let us know, and we will get back to you. Thank you.